Kay's book, Ruined by the Ton, which is uh, book two in the Misfits of the Ton series, mm -hmm. releases first. So I was doing the TikTok for this one, and the the, the setup is so sad. I'm like, can you tell us about the book? Yeah, it's a it's a kind of age gap romance, but but actually both characters grow grow up. I think one just gets a bit more worldly wise, and one just realizes what a what an idiot he is and and then has to mature throughout, throughout the book so uh, yeah it was set up in the first in the first book although you don't really have to read the first book to know what's what's going on and this this poor debutante Beatrice who's a she's an orphan but her cousin has taken her in as a guardian um during the first book she was incited into an elopement by an absolute rogue um but the elopement was it was aborted by actually the heroine in, in book one so the heroine brought her back and managed to spread a rumor about oh we just went to the seaside for a holiday um but there's still a kind of cloud of rumor around this this girl Beatrice and she's so, so she feels kind of a bit, bit crushed by the whole thing so she's really nervous she's really timid she just doesn't trust men and then enter this amazing man who's older he's got kind eyes he's a he's a widower um and his late wife was a, a treacherous what's it so she died giving birth to um her lover's child uh, and yes, then the child died like... <laughs> Something so, just were lying on TikTok, and I thought this is so bad. <laughs> poor really man. <laughs> but what happens is these two they just share a connection. It's like two lost souls, their eyes meet across a crowded room, and she's like his Augustus the hero is like Beatrice is his broken, broken angel, and he just falls completely head over heels in love with oh, her. Geez. She falls completely head over heels in, in love with him. But there's a couple of kind of nasty side, I mean, there's first friends, but nasty side characters in the um, in society as well. And one of the nasty side characters tricks Beatrice into appearing in an uncompromising position with a, a rake. Oh. And we all know what's going to happen is she then says to Augustus, oh, Beatrice wants to see you. So Augustus drops along <gasps> the corridor and he bursts open and he sees this... Um, compromising position and he's already aware that Beatrice has this this cloud of of scandal mm -hmm. around her so he's like okay now fine that's okay I'm, I'm all right with that but then when he sees this he really begins mm. to to doubt it so um <sighs> but he still he still loves her so he still goes through with the marriage because he loves her and he wants her to be happy but he kind of can't bear to be there so he, so he we does don't get the really love love marriage. love thing till after the wedding stuff yeah Oh, those are the best. <laughs> so he, he does tell her that he loves her, but also he marries her because he says, if, if you are actually really, really compromised in the way that, you know, you know, then at least if anything happens, if you have a child, we can say it's mine. So that's because he, so he kind of loves her, but he's he's really bad at expressing his love. So he runs back off to Italy after he which is where he ran after his late late wife died. You know, like like any mature, self respecting man would do, he <laughs> runs away from the from the problem. Um, so he then comes back two years later, full of guilt, full of remorse, saying, "I've left this like timid, very immature mm -hmm. young lady behind." Um, and so he trots off to his country estate, and boy, is he in for a shock when he sees this one. Beatrice has what well, she has so grown up in the in the two year absence so um so the book actually starts when they're reunited and he's kind of creeping around this house party creeps into her bedroom and he's kind of confronted by what he says is a, a harpy with a pistol brandishing at his brandishing it at his chest um which he deserves which yes yeah he deserves <laughs> he, he just deserves a good clout around the head and they they try and i mean there's a lot of miscommunication they try and communicate but he really has to kind of work through his feelings of of jealousy and rejection from that the past uh his, his kind of past wife so even though they try and talk they still don't quite trust one another one another and, and Beatrice is so angry she kind of wants to get her own back but she accepts that she loves him so the two of them kind of dance around each other in the estate um and she's holding these wild parties because she kind of she's brought the estate back from ruination it's a prosperous estate but she's having a bit of fun as, as well and she's having these parties away from society because she's like well society kicked me in the teeth so I'm going to have my own little society in in my house so all these outrageous things happens and, and she treats badly behaved men um she gives them you know a lot of retribution and she punishes them for what they for what they do in loads of kind of oh we love Beatrice Beatrice is the best <laughs> she's yeah she is she is so I oh yeah I adore her she's so cool um so she's a bit tomboy up boyish she's a yeah she's a strong 
character, but actually she's brought back um, loads of, yeah, in the state, she brought back lots, lots of people who kind of left the estate. They've come back to the estate because it's now prosperous. She provides a home for abandoned women. There's um, her husband's valet has got a sister and a widowed mother. So she brings them into the estate and she gives them a purpose and she gives them a job and she gives them a home. So she's she's pretty cool, but she still can't quite forgive Augustus because he really broke her heart two, two years ago. So um, they just kind of dance around each other for the rest of the story. And then eventually they come to realise when when things are at the brink of disaster, they come to realise that actually we do love each other. And we, we really ought to tell each other that we love each other. Aww. But he has to do some stuff to make up for it, right? Because I'm seeing that like Beatrice has got things situated. She, you know, like, she's got to bring something to the table. Right? Yeah. He's going to do lots of groveling, um, right? <laughs> Yeah, lots of lots of groveling, and he he has to during the harvest festival. He uh, well during the harvest he he has to basically strip off down to the breaches and help the men in the fields with you know, with the with the oh, side wow. and everything. Which is yeah, bitch just quite enjoys that. Oh, of course he does. <laughs> so yeah, and there's a few things that he does, and he kind of he, he plans a nice surprise for her, but she doesn't realise until it's almost too late that he's planning this nice surprise. But yeah, it all comes good in the end. But uh, yeah, it's I had a lot of fun writing writing that one and I, oh. I like an older hero as, yeah. as well it but, sounds like uh, it and I love I love it when I love it when the the happily ever after starts after the wedding I love that I love that trope when you know when, when yeah. the couple's already together and then they have to realize that they're actually in love with each other and find you know find a way yeah and they've got to kind of work at it together and, and sort of settle into a routine in terms of yeah just looking after the house and it just it looks at their married life and how it's yeah, it's not happy ever after walking to the sunset. They still actually yeah. got to work at this work at this marriage. So uh, yeah. yeah, that's really nice. Really. Sounds like so much fun. And that's um, Misfits of the Town. How many more books of those do we get? There's a there's another five. Um, so I'm actually oh, writing book three. yeah, I'm, I'm writing book three at the moment, which is um, yeah, it's Thief of the Tom. So it's one of one of their friends who it's a bit of a kind of cat and mouse game, kind of cross between the Tom's Crown affair. Um, where they're kind of dancing around each other, but he's the investigator and she's the the thief who's playing all sorts of all sorts of tricks. And then um, then there's another friend of theirs who's all autistic and has kind of got a secret infatuation for like this this really brash extrovert duke. Um, and then later on, actually, the the woman who puts Beatrice in the compromising position, she's like a real antagonist, but she kind of has a she gets her comeuppance. And then she's going to get her own story when she's like really suffered for what she's for what she's done. Um, what she's a redemption arc! Her own story. <laughs> yeah. So at the moment she's being really nasty, but she is actually going to. I'm then going to delve into why she's why she's nasty and give her a bit of a redemption at the uh, at the end of the. We're going to need to see some bad things happen to her first, though. Yeah, there's a few more bad things to come. Really bad things actually in the fourth book because she's she's the sister of the autistic heroine and she's like really nasty to her to her heroine. So. Um, but she's oh she's going to get her come up and okay well, as long as as long as as long as it all works out at the end and 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 the scales balance and then I and then then it's okay yeah absolutely awesome well that all like that that sounds like so much fun um, and you can get ruined you can get ruined by the town now that's the one that releases this week so um <coughs> Terry, <laughs> Terry has the fir her first dragon blade book which is the lady takes it all not just some of it she takes all of it <laughs> all of it and it's um book one in the unexpected airs of scotland series and this one releases wide so if you read on something other than than kindle um you can you want to grab it right away because it will go into kindle unlimited very quickly but but it right. releases wide, so you have the option to, to get it on the other And the pages. cover's lovely. I love yeah. the cover. It's and so it's colorful. Oh, the cover's lovely, is right. It's it's just great. And it and it just picks up on the whole atmosphere of the story. I love it. I love it. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, sure. Um, um, the Lady Takes It All is the first book in my Unexpected Heirs of Scotland. So... Of course, somebody unexpectedly inherits. And in this case, it's uh, my hero. Now, I do have a cross purpose in this series. I decided that all of the heroes are my celebrity crushes. And so Ooh, each of them is modeled after someone I either have or had a wild crush on. And so my first hero is my current wild crush. Um, am I allowed to reveal who it is? Well, yeah, I would be disappointed if you didn't. It's an, and it's an unexpected crush because it's Josh Gates from the Discovery Channel. 
He does <gasps> Expedition Unknown. Unknown. He's and such a I, I am crushing hard. I'm crushing hard. My husband knows he's already on my dispensation list. If I meet him in person, no, no telling. Um, and so I kind of used his personality and his background. Um, and so Joshua Robertson is my first hero, and he is an adventurer. Um, Scottish, lives in near Edinburgh, and um, he's an academic, a historian, an archaeologist, adventurer. And so he has a wild discovery, and he is fated by all, and, and all wonderful things happen. But there are rumors, and the find is tainted. And the only thing that saves him is his cousin unexpectedly dies, and he inherits, and um, a, he's a Viscount. And so now it's like society accepts him, but not really. And he's not really a Viscount. He is still an academic and, and all that. And the only and so he's living his life, dealing with these rumors, writing books, and in comes his new housekeeper, um, who is the daughter of the man who caused him every problem that happened after the find. <clears throat> Except she's been living with a different story. All of her life, her father told her it was Josh who had caused all the problems oh, and had cheated him and had lied to the public. And, and so she is on a quest for revenge because her father has died now. And so she is hired in disguise as his housekeeper to find proof that he is a liar and that it will remove the taint from her father. So she's not the housekeeper in, dis in disguise. She's hired... She's hired as a housekeeper. She actually oh, has some experience oh. as a housekeeper, but she's there purely to hunt and find proof. And um, and he's really dismayed because he really likes her, and she's different. And she is, you know, and she's of, of course beautiful and all that. But she's smart, and he keeps saying to himself, "I can't like her because she's my employee." But there's a real sexual tension that builds, um, and she discovers, you know, along the way. I won't tell you what happens, how it happens, but she discovers, of course, the truth along the way, that he is not what he seems, and neither was her father. And so, um, yes. Uh, and of course, when he discovers who she is, that doesn't go well either. Um, so, I can imagine. So, I mean, yeah, we have not to like each other. I mean, this uh, is perfect. There's tension all over the place. It's got the I enemies, love the lovers, hidden, uh, hidden identity, secret treasure. There's a treasure. There's possibly a map. There's um, so, um, and of course, the forbidden tension between you know, the whole setup between he, him being a lord and her being a commoner. And so, yeah, lots of tension. And my, I will say this, you know, I know everybody gets author quotes and gets wonderful review quotes. My best review quote actually came from my critique partner who has read, well, she's my critiquer. Um, she's read everything I've ever written. And she said to me in an email after she read this, that the love scene that they have is the hottest thing I've ever written. Oh. So she's to me, that's, heart. <laughs> that's just a great, okay, I'm mm -hmm. good with that. So. That's, the, that's the best when somebody that you trust says, says that. That's the best. And it's a, fun, it's a fun love scene mm -hmm. because I just love to have, I like to have, you know, fun. And well, they and Josh fun. Gates would have fun. Like oh, that, that would be fun. <laughs> that would be giggling. There would just you know like <laughs> Yes. His self-deprecation, his, mm -hmm. you know, his, just his whole personality that does come through in Joshua Robertson. So yes. Oh, oh it tickles me that you picked a, that you picked a real celebrity crush to, to base your, your hero yes. on. Yes. And there are two more. So <laughs> yes. So there are two more books in the series? Yeah, the series is three books. Um, the Lady Takes It All is the first one. Um, a Lady's Agreement, which I'm writing, finishing right now, is the second. And then The Lady's Tutor is the third. And oh, cool. The Lady's Tutor is kind of a twist on My Fair Lady. Oh, fun. Uh, oh. Yes. Um, but uh, my crush in my second book, the one that I'm finishing now, I don't know if you were General Hospital fans, but my oh, first, yes, my first Scotsman, my first Scotsman was Duke Lavery. 
and Ian Buchanan is the actor. And I, oh, I wanted, I discovered I Scotland. I look it up. I discovered Scotland because of Duke Lavery, a Duke and Anna, oh, mm -hmm. quintessential love story. And um, so the second book, The Ladies' Agreement, is based on Duke Lavery, Ian Buchanan. Um, and the third one is Eric Stoltz, who um, my red haired, my ginger from Rob Roy and oh. from not, um, He was oh. in the mask, wasn't he, as well, when he was He was in the mask and he was in yeah. Caprica, Caprica, if you like sci-fi or Battlestar Galactica, the prequel, he was one of the main characters. Oh, I didn't so, realize he was in Caprica. Yes. So he's my third one. So well, I'm having a lot of fun. I, and my, my husband kind of wondered about the entire like wall of pictures of men. <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> It's been fun. The wall of men is research. It's yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the series will focus on That's someone good. who unexpectedly inherits wealth or a title mm -hmm. or property or something. And, yeah. and then how it changes their life. Yeah. Those fish out of water heroes are always so much fun. Mm -hmm. you know. Like, yes. So oh, that's, that sounds, that's, that's where I'm fun. headed with those. <laughs> Oh, that sounds great. And I may make a requirement that like people when they come on have to have the celebrity crush to go along with their books. Because, <laughs> because I they, have, I have messaged, well, I've not messaged him yet, but um, I, I do, you know, I posted about him being the, the hero. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if he gets the information. <laughs> My my kiddos, I have three three boys, and they loved um, Expedition Unknown, and we were we were just huge Expedition Unknown fans. And he's he's so much fun, you know. He he's is. Just, he he's is a giggly, big, tall, goofy, and you can just imagine him going through all these countries, and he's just like you know the giant amongst the whole entire rest of the world, you know. Yes, yes. And his series that he did during the pandemic, during lockdown, he did one called Josh Gates Tonight that was oh, just I miss that. Oh, it's on, it's on demand somewhere. It is, there's, it starts out with a drink. There's always the drink at the beginning. So, and, um. Because so pandemic was, drinking was a real thing. Yes, <laughs> yes. And they were always, they were always teamed up with the theme of the show. So it mm -hmm. made it fun. The, the best one we liked was there was one for, I forget the name of it, but it was for the Edgar Allan Poe show. Mm -hmm. So it turned out to be black and purple. It was lovely. Oh, cool. Oh, I'm gonna have to look for that. Um, Emily is 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 in a much later time zone than we are. So she is already she has already started with a with a uh, special uh, drink yeah, for I have oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. It's a present from my youngest. I don't know if you can you can see the wording. Uh, oops, let's move it. No, so mommy's happy juice or mother's oh, happy juice. I like that. <laughs> mommy, my happy juice all day is iced tea in a big cup. Okay. <laughs> iced tea. I'm nursing coffee and minions. So uh, I did. I can only do one caffeine a day, so I already had that. So this is my homebrew decaf iced tea all day. Oh, I should probably only do one caffeine a day, but I doubt it's not what I do. <laughs> so. I try and stop mid-afternoon. I'll go through tea like you wouldn't believe. I'm like mm -hmm. a massive tea drinker. I think it's such a British thing. But uh, mid-afternoon, I'll then switch to, to decaf tea. Um, I don't know if it makes a difference, though, because I've had so much caffeine already. <laughs> I'm still bouncing off the moon. I'm sure your happy juice will help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Combat the caffeine. <laughs> so sugar and, sugar and milk or, or naked? Uh, just milk. Just milk. In tea. I, yeah. I used to take sugar in tea and then I was, I was kind of weaned off it um and I used to, I used to have tea without sugar and coffee with sugar and I remember going to a friend's house and she said oh do you want a coffee in the morning I said oh yeah can I have a sugar please and in the afternoon she offered me a cup of tea and just assumed that if I took tea and coffee I'd take uh, sorry, I'd sugar, sugar and tea. Yeah, crazy. I'd take yeah. sugar and tea as well. So she put sugar in tea, and it was the most disgusting thing I'd ever tasted. So I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to have sugar in coffee because I don't want to run the risk. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge tea, tea drinker too, but my my hot tea has to have milk and sugar. Yeah, or milk and Splenda, milk and Splenda. Yeah, no, I can't do I can't do um I can't do milk, but I but I have to have the sugar too. So. <laughs> so Terry, we haven't ever had a chance to talk before, so no. I know nothing about how you write your books. I I grill everybody because. <laughs> 
<laughs> because everybody has such a different way of doing yes. it. Some people are linear. Some people write in, in, in chunks. Some people outline. Some people don't. How do how do you do? Are you a plotter? Or are you a pantser? How do you how do you set up your books? I am. Um, well, I've I've changed a little over the books. I've because I've written. This is I think my fifty fourth book I'm working on now. I put your interview up today. I was like, that is a lot of books. <laughs> a lot of books. Um, and up until just a couple years ago. I was exclusively a deadline binger and I'm a procrastinator by nature. I've honed it to a level of expertise that is second to none. And so I I'd learned it in school. I never did anything until the night before it was due and I turned it in, but sadly I was rewarded by getting good grades. Yeah. So it just reinforced the process. So when I had my first book, um, I had written, uh, about maybe three chapters, a little bit more than that, and had the chance to present it to an editor on TV. And later I was picked, well, before I was picked for this TV show, and they said to me, you have a book ready. And I said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> and they said, okay, <laughs> bring a copy of it next week when you come to the <gasps> And I said, of course I will. <laughs> and so I ended up writing, I'd say more than two thirds of the book in a week. And sadly, it turned out pretty well. <laughs> so that's your process. <laughs> it's just kind of, so I do know, I always know um, it's, it's usually character driven. It usually mm -hmm. is about what the characters have to do for me so that they're important. Sometimes I will have a plot in mind and then the characters will start to creep in. Um, I always know the beginning and I sometimes will write the end before I write anything else. Oh, wow. I, I know where it's going. Um, and then I am mostly linear in between, mm -hmm. but I've had stories where there will be scenes that will bother me so much it will wake me up at night and I will sit down and I will write the scene in a, a doc out of your head and just get it out of my head. I have no idea where it's going to go. Don't have any idea. And, um, and then suddenly, or not suddenly, but when I get to the point where that scene is meant to be, that's where it, uh, it hits. So I've done that too. Um, my problem is that when I come up with the great beginnings and ends, I never know how they're going to get there. So they don't always tell me. And so I always find out things when the readers do. Um, and I wish that my characters would behave better, but they just will not do it. I, I just had a situation in the story. It was like, there's a villain that shows up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's been the villain all along. And I didn't even realize it. <laughs> but it, when I went back and reread parts, it was like, oh. Well, he there is. he is. There yeah. he is. Why <laughs> wasn't I like paying attention? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the middle oh. A lot of the middle is a very big surprise to me. Oh, I love that. I think I think one of the the um, parts that's difficult is when you know things ahead of time, and then it's like I don't have to write that. I know how I know what happens, you know. So the idea of of, of getting to discover the whole book as you're going through is really like that's yes. that's very very cool. And it was kind of funny. I like I said, I was a big pan, a big. A deadline binger. And then, uh, you know, the pandemic and just before that was a real rough time for me and it changed the way I write. And so I'm rediscovering it. And um, so it's been interesting. These last three books I've written, I haven't known what to expect. And they've been quieter, slower books, but then now I'm on a binge. So <laughs> I, have, I guess I haven't grown up yet. I just, uh, I'm waiting. There's something about that procrastinating thing that um, like when you can do it, it's like all the wheels are on barely by the skin of your teeth. And then and then if something happens and one of them falls off, I always find it to be so shocking because it's like, but but and you know, like I would tell my sister or somebody else and they're like, what did you think was going to happen? Well, not that. Right. You know? right. Like, oh, yeah. The best laid plans. I mean, it's yeah. it's true. But it just for some reason now and I've I'm a brain geek. Uh, I, I'm a dental hygienist in real life, and so I've, I've got the big science background, and I'm a brain geek, and I just love um, understanding why our brains do it. And with procrastination, it's all about the reward, you yeah. know, and the brain chemical rush that you get when you do it well. And, and it actually prevents your brain from doing it a different way. So oh, I didn't do that. 
Yeah. So you, the procrastination you reinforces itself. You literally get it. The brain gets addicted to the chemical rush of the reward. <laughs> and then it's like you could have all the time in the world, but if there's no push to, you know, yeah. it just doesn't happen. So yeah, it's crazy stuff. Don't mess with brains. <laughs> I, I took a, a psychology class a couple of years ago, and one of the um, one of the the most interesting parts to me was we, it was a memory class. It was it, the focus was on memory and the idea that that created memories are essentially the same as actual memories. You know, it's like uh, that's yeah. that still terrifies me. Memory is completely <laughs> unreliable. Yeah, still terrifies me. Yes. <laughs> so, but... so oh, Emily, how do you do yours? Um, I, oh, I can't, I, it's a bit like a painter. I think, I'm trying to think, actually. You remember, don't you? You remember how to do I, Yeah, I think, I think it, it kind of, yeah, writing kind of happens, but I do, I spend ages working out the whole, the whole plot. So yeah, I'll have a beginning and the end. That, that will be the first thing that I'll have. And then I'll, I'll start plotting it, but, but scenes will come into my head at, at random. So I'll, I'll normally get like a big kind of rug pull scene when, everything just goes belly up and it looks like it's going to be really horrific and there's like massive emotional scenes and angst and everyone's hating each other I think of those and I kind of dot those in and then gradually the rest of it comes into focus and I'll kind of scribble all these notes in my notebook and then at some point it's just like it's like a magic eye picture you know you kind of stare at the magic eye picture but don't look at it and then suddenly the (laughs) Yeah, the image comes sure. um, yeah. so then I'll kind of grab that image and then I'll I'll write out uh, a detailed plot and I'll write out character profiles and I'll draw oh my goodness map. you do all of it I'll do, yeah I'll do all of that before I even start start drafting and then only when it's all done and dusted will I then draft and I basically draft from start to finish so even if I get to a, a difficult bit and I know there's a scene later on that's calling to me. I won't write that scene. I'll write the difficult scene because my reward will then be getting to the easy scene after. Because yeah. I, <laughs> I know yeah. if I write the easy scene, I'll never get back to the difficult scene. Because I'm a terrible procrastinator, but I try to, <laughs> I try to manage it and force myself, <laughs> force myself not to, not to do that. And I, I used to do a lot of rock climbing. Um, which, with rock climbing, if you get to the crux of the climb. You, you can't climb the easy bit you've got to no, you've got you got to get through it last bit before you can even get to the get to the top so that's that's kind of how I how I treat the <laughs> treat the book so so I'll know in advance who who the villains are um they might be end up being a bit more villainous than I intended them to be or more often than not they'll be vill- villainous but I'll get to the end of the book and they'll they'll be kind of chatting away to me going can I at least give you my side of the story, please? And the next book will end up being. <laughs> That's right, because the, the villain is the hero of their story. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. You don't want. Occasionally, I've got someone who's like an out and out boo hiss, but there, you know, there is a reason why they get killed off. So that's fine. We don't mind killing them off. But if, I have, <laughs> if I have a villain who who survives, then yeah, I like then to flip it around and say actually this is why they behaved in. In, in that way and then someone who really hates them um, I've, I've had readers who say I really I really hated that character I really mm-hmm. hope in the next book they're going to redeem themselves and it's like phew when they when they do yeah. so um, but yeah I'm really it, it seems very methodical but the way the ideas come together it's just kind of random and sort of pops into my pops into my head but I, I do struggle I'm, I'm writing book three at the moment and I've got the the scenes for book four and some of the angsty scenes in book four I just Every time I go to sleep, they're there in my face. Mm-hmm. Every time I'm trying to write book three, they're, they're there. But the way I deal with it is jotting down the notes and then that kind of clears it off my head. I know when I get there, the, the words will will come. But it's, yeah, it's I have to avoid, stop myself from being distracted, um, which I think is a, it's a kind of ADHD thing. I think which procrastination is an ADHD. It's shiny ball. Thing, all thing, brain, so. all brain yeah. stuff. All brain yeah. stuff. It's all the shiny, shiny, shiny stuff that you want to do instead of what you have to do. And then you realize yeah. it's not quite so shiny, so you have to go back to what you yeah. originally do. Emily, are you a are you a drafter? Do you do many drafts or are you done with Yeah, I do um yeah, I'll do a full on draft right through from start to finish, and then I'll go back and do the edits, but I, I tend to find, unless my editor says, you've so got to rewrite this, I, I tend to find I don't have to do that many structural edits. I've kind of sorted out the structural edits when I'm doing the, the plot. So my my plots end up being five or 6,000 words. Um, oh, wow. Quite, <laughs> quite, a, 
quite they're quite detailed. And often when I'm plotting it, bits of dialogue will come. So I'll, I'll kind of drop drop down bits of dialogue when I'm when I'm plotting. So normally once I've got the first draft, it doesn't require that much to get it into into shape to have it. Specific. That's like giving yourself presents when you when you sit down to write and you already have like little bits and pieces of things. It's like leaving little little breadcrumb presents for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we outgrow that. We need rewards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And treats, you know, it's like yeah. and bribes and things. Like you know? yes. <laughs> yes. And writer friends to tell you that you can't write the shiny ball right now. You have to write the book that you have to have finished and turned in on time. And then you can get to the shiny ball. Yes. You know? like, we call that among my writer friends, we call that the monkey on your back yes. book or <laughs> scene. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's going to be there unless you put it someplace else. So yes. like you do, I jot down notes, just get it out. And, yeah. and then I'm good. I can ignore it. And a little wait, it'll a wait monkey for you. On your back. Monkey on your back. <laughs> it's always more fun. Well, ladies, the time has just flown past. This was this was so lovely to talk to both of you. We could keep going forever. Um, it was it was really a treat, and we are we are over time now. So, oh. so, so um, I will put the links to the books in the chat so you can grab them right away. Make sure if you want Terry's book on anything other than Amazon, you get it right away because it, it's released it released on the other retailers, but it will go into Kindle Unlimited very shortly. You want to get your Dragon Blade books as soon as they come out or on pre-order period because that's when there's a very best deal and they are a really good deal i'm like downloading just carrie's book just for that hot <laughs> scene <I've been. laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm, i know when I'm your writer hot. friend says it's the hottest one then you really pretty much like you gotta you know it involves so much just think <laughs> think food think middle eastern think exotic oh, oh lord oh i'm going to now <laughs> and it's with josh gates so <laughs> there's so much to love so much to love. It's true. All right, ladies. Well, it was. It has been a delight. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us, and we will be back here at the same time next week. Thanks so much. Thank Yay. you. It's been fun.